Um, the um, talks which have been given today uh, really sort of cleared a lot of groundwork by insisting on the analytical clarity and differentiation of categories. And that's basically what I am going to do um, in the language of literature. I'm going to do it, the relation between experience, knowledge, and representation in English literature from the early modern period to postmodernism. And I'm going to do it in four centennial strides. Concretely, my analysis will include literature from the early modern period, from British Romanticism, from modernism, and from postmodernism. The basic question I'm going to address is what's first, experience, knowledge, or representation? Depending on which constellations the fictional texts expose, the implied models of consciousness will differ significantly. I'm going to approach the topic from a hermeneutic perspective. This makes it necessary to say a few words about my methodology in order to clear up the relationship between science and consciousness with view to hermeneutics. Hermeneutics basically for all the humanities I would say in Western academies is what empiricism is for the natural sciences. The combination of science and consciousness, science understood as natural sciences in the title of this conference, is problematic from a hermeneutic perspective. Hermeneutic research differs from the methodology of science because the objects of investigation are different. Quote, in the humanities it is the human mind in a broad way in, in science, things not necessarily human or even animate. Objects of hermeneutic investigation are manifestations of human consciousness in all its aspects, in the arts, in historiography, in ethnology, anthropology, philosophy, or in the sciences, but seen as texts, summed up under the blanket term of culture. Another quote, this difference is codified in the opposition between Verstehen, hermeneutic understanding, and Erklären, scientific explanation. The German expressions Verstehen und Erklären have been used here, although the quote is in English, because German philosophers from Schleiermacher through Diltai in the 19th century to Gadamer in the 20th century have been a foundational significance for the development of this methodology. Hermeneutic operations are, focusing on the world, are not focusing on the world of materiality governed by laws of nature. Hermeneutic operations focus on the fact that human beings live in and by worlds of meaning, ranging from traffic signs to entire worldviews. It is the researchers immersion in this world of meaning which ensures access to the object of investigation in the first place. However, as these models of meaning differ widely between individuals as well as cultures and historical epochs, the ultimate aim for Gadamer is a Horizontverschmelzung, a merging of horizons in order to transcend the limits circumscribed by culturally and historically specific worldviews. What is the contribution literature can give to our subject? Literature is a privileged medium to illustrate and at the same time negotiate concepts of consciousness, not as a mirror of reality, but as an inter-discourse. This means that fictional texts are immersed in the historically and culturally specific views of world and values through the minds of the historical authors and authoresses and through the aesthetic, material, social, medial, and political conditions 
of literary production. Because this is so, literature allows us to observe consciousness at work, experiencing, interpreting, and representing itself and the world, always conditioned by widely divergent epistemological and cultural horizons. Literary language draws attention to the fact that it is constructing the world, and this is the really significant difference to just using language in everyday conversation. Better, literary language draws attention to the fact that it entices the reader to construct a world. It makes us conscious of what we are doing incessantly anyway, as the homo interpretans we are. Friedrich Nietzsche, for example, criticized realist literature because it only mimics the dominant picture of the world and thus makes us forget that what we call reality is always a possible worldview only. And this perfectly ties in with what Chris Field said. It is a commonplace that consciousness is what it is about. That consciousness is created in the performance of consciousness. Thus, literature is a medium which allows us to study consciousness in action, generating possible worlds and at the same time implicitly and explicitly reflecting on this performance. I shall address this self-reflected third-order observation by focusing on the explicit and on the aesthetic negotiations of the relationship between experience, knowledge, and representation. And with this, we're coming to our first epoch, the early modern period. The basic structure for present-day discussions about issues related to consciousness, at least in the Occident, have been laid in the early modern period. William Shakespeare's drama Hamlet, which was staged first in London 1599, is considered a key testimony of the Occidental early modern episteme in Michel Foucault's words. The title hero is already marked as the first modern hero on stage by four references in Act I that he has studied at the university in Wittenberg, Germany, which was founded in 1501. The story of Hamlet takes place before the 12th century, so studying in Wittenberg was actually impossible. Why Wittenberg? The answer is, it was Wittenberg where Martin Luther posted his 95 Thesis of his Reformed faith at the church doors in 1517. Luther, the spokesman of the Protestant Reformation, held that each individual is responsible for his or her spiritual welfare without taking recourse to darkness proclaimed by the Pope of the Catholic Church. The only guide to spiritual self-examination should be the individual study of the Bible, sola scriptura. This presupposed literacy a cultural technique not available for many people yet. Gutenberg had only established his printing press about 60 years earlier. Luther's demand transfers the truth claims of the medieval world based on universally valid divine truths to the individual interpretation of the written text and the forum internum or the inner vision of the individual. Religious faith here is intellectualized and subjectivized. With this background, the anachronism of studying in Wittenberg marks Hamlet as a modern man who does not trust in traditional beliefs but has to ascertain 
the truth of any statement by intellectual investigation, a sort of common conviction in um, Occidental uh, studies of mentality, that this is the decisive break for the development of Occidental epistemology. Luther's request that each person critically assess their innermost motives, desires, and fears, him or herself, requires consciousness to turn upon itself as a controlling force, thereby enacting the original sense of consciousness, namely conscience. According to the OED, an inner feeling or voice viewed as acting as a guide to the rightness or wrongness of one's behavior. Both terms, consciousness and conscience, have a Latin verb as a root, conscire from con, meaning with, plus skire, know, with knowledge. The English word consciousness, from its origin, primarily uh, is used as an agent of moral control. And this has shaped the whole history of mentality in Great Britain. The Lutheran book centeredness, the Bible, also implies radical shifts in attitudes towards representation. The Reformation, quote, the Reformation has abolished or literary blackened medieval church rituals with all of their visual glitter and replaced them with a monochromatic, namely black and white, mystery of printed letters. This is a quote by Friedrich Kittler, a media historian. This historical background explains why Hamlet does not simply obey the command of his father ghost to revenge his murder by killing the murderer Claudius, but instead tries to assemble ocular proof as Othello, another modern hero of Shakespeare, calls it, and assess its validity in the light of reason. He does this by adopting the empirical methodology of the so-called new sciences, just recently established by Francis Bacon. In his Instauratio Magna, his grand renewal, Thus, Hamlet incorporates the epistemological turning point from the Middle Ages to modernity in two fundamental ways. One, the play exhibits the change from gaining knowledge by belief in religion or in cultural dogmas to generating knowledge by the methodology of the new sciences. Conceptually, this is indicated by the shift from conscience to consciousness in the modern abstract sense of a mental state or the ground for epistemic systems. And two, Hamlet represents the individualization of generating knowledge. And we have to be aware that when we from the West are talking about the self, we are talking about a rather recent invention, to put it that way. It's only like 400 years old, and it has emerged out of entirely different cultural conditions from when people from the Orient are speaking about the self. He does, Hamlet, does all this by probing fundamental problems of the new sciences. The first one is the dominant sense organ to acquire knowledge in Occidental epistemology from Plato's cave parable onwards has been visuality. And I've just given you here sort of for remembrance sake a picture of this cave parable where the sun represents the ultimate wisdom, but human beings are living in a cave, not even knowing that there is a sun outside. So it's visuality, right, light and seeing things. Indeed, the German word for consciousness, Bewusstsein, stems from the old Germanic Wissen, meaning having seen something. And um, lots of philosophy of the mind and of identity is now uh, thinking about the implications of the um, metaphorics, the metaphors of visuality, because they imply observer observed, they imply 
a hierarchy between the subject and the object. They imply central distance. In this context, the centrality of seeing, observing, and being observed in Shakespeare's play, which has been noted by many critics, is a dramatic negotiation about the validity of gaining knowledge by experience and experiment, and the problems of interpreting the sense data. Act one has this um, dialogue between Hamlet and his friend Horatio, who has also studied in Wittenberg. So we have two modern men here. My father, methinks I see my father. Where, my lord? In my mind's eye, Horatio. I saw him once, it was a goodly king. It was a man, take him for all in all, I shall not look upon his like again. My lord, I think I saw him yesternight. The scene demonstrates that in Hamlet's case, his visual remembrance dominates the physical experience of the present. Whereas Horatio at first recalls an actual meeting in the past with Hamlet's father, and then informs Hamlet of his conviction that he has seen the ghost of the murdered king walking around the night before, and it's all seeing. The dialogue exposes that the individual experience of a visual image is no guarantee for the existence of a material referent, but maybe a personal fantasy, and thus possess no truth value at all. In the episteme of the early modern period, it would not even count as an experience, because experience has the same etymological root as experiment, namely the Latin experientia, from experiri, try, or put to the test. And experience and experiment were being used interchangeably with experiment till late 18th century. The dialogue confirms John Scott's thesis that, quote, what counts as experience is neither self-evident nor straightforward. straightforward. It is always contested, always therefore political. And of course, with this attitude, it would be impossible say, to save a concept like the self by referring it to the experience because experience is similarly deconstructed in this way. This does not suggest that Hamlet's imagination is meaningless, because Hamlet's idealized memory of his father motivates most of his behavior. After Hamlet and Horatio have agreed that there has been a ghost, that there is a referent, the relation between perception, sign, and referent, or between individual experience and its meaning, poses a new problem. Because now they have to evaluate what it is a sign of, how they have to interpret the apparition. John Scott once more, experience, that was this quote, is at once always already an interpretation and is in need of interpretation. Interpreting a sign means to put it into the horizon of a specific knowledge system. So, good students that they are, Hamlet and Horatio weigh the dominant theories about ghosts in the early modern period, namely the Catholic belief that ghosts were messengers from the purgatory and the orthodox Protestant view that ghosts sometimes were angels, yet in most cases devils incarnate. Unable to decide, Hamlet asks the ghost itself. Yet not being sure in the first place how to evaluate the source of information, he cannot trust anything the ghost tells him. Towards the end of the drama, Shakespeare has his hero give up all claims to a legitimation according to the methodology of the new sciences, and lets him revert to the medieval honor code of his father, which leads to the death of almost everyone on stage, and that's the tragedy. Okay, the second important thing I said uh, in Hamlet is that this is seen as the first um, sort of public display of a self 
of what later on would become in the epistemology of the West, the self. It is the received opinion that this discourse of the self was initiated in the early modern period by Protestantism, spreading lit literacy, which is a very monological action, and the methodology of monological reasoning, as Jürgen Habermas, the German philosopher of the Frankfurt School, calls it, in the new sciences. When Hamlet's mother Gertrude admonishes her son to curb his excessive mourning for the deceased father because it is not seemly, Hamlet answers her, seems, madam, nay, it is. I know not seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, together with all forms, modes, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. These indeed seem, but I have that within which passes show. That's the purple passage. These but the trappings and the suits of woe. For many critics, Hamlet's self-reflexivity heralds an individual interiority as the locus or even origin of experience. Terry Egerton reads Hamlet as a radically transitional figure sprung out between a traditional medieval social order to which he is modern and a future epoch of achieved bourgeois individualism. For my topic, it is noteworthy that here an organizing distinction is generated between an inner life or a real self, which eludes any methodology of ocular proof, and an exteriority which only seems yet furnishes the sense data necessary to proceed according to the tenets of empirical methodology. And of course, with Locke and Hume and all these empirical philosophers, um, you know, they um, worked on these concepts. This abyss between a supposed origin of consciousness in the individual and a material outside between body and mind, materiality and epistemology has been fixed philosophically roughly 50 years later by René Descartes in his six uh, Meditationes de Prima Philosophia, where his rigorous skepticism towards any truth claims regarding the material world culminates in the cogito ergo sum. And if you translate it from the context, it's not I'm thinking, therefore I am, that's sort of the normal translation, but from the context, it would be more adequately translated like, I can know nothing, but that at this very moment, I am a thinking being. So because I know this, I must assume that I am. That's the way of reasoning in this, your know, Latin is a very elliptical language. John Milton, in his grand epic, Paradise Lost, tries to critically assess the new sciences, see their potential, and still somehow connect them with his Christian faith. He does this by introducing a differentiation between wrong reason, enacted by the rebellious archangel Saint Satan, and right reason, which is taught to Adam after his fall into knowledge by the archangel Raphael. Wrong reason exhibits a self-sufficient, because so what Milton does, he uh, talks about wrong reason and right reason, and wrong reason is a reason which has all the logics, but which does not accept that there is a context for reasoning, which does not accept in religious uh, language that there is something before. Of course, there it would be God. Right reason is a reasoning which has to acknowledge that it has a context, that there has been something before reason. And of course, for in the Christian faith, that's God. So in that way, um, but the problem is, by reasoning, reason will not find out about its origin. So there has to come the archangel Raphael to tell Adam about this. So this enacts this, um, the context. Okay. The second epoch is Romanticism. Roughly 150 years later, the Romantics are the first writers 
to deal with the relationship of experience, knowledge, and representation, not only aesthetically, but also in discursive essays. They are also the most radical critics of empirical sciences, which had become the cultural authority in defining reality during the 18th century. And they explicitly voice the need for an entirely new epistemology. Aesthetically, they show this by now not taking light as a positive metaphor for knowledge, but it's negative. For them, the positive things of the mind happen in darkness. Happen, so it's a completely different concept of what it means to be conscious, to interact with the world. Of course, um, I'm going to skip this because we already heard about Kant. I'm going to give you some examples by the romantic poet William Blake, who was also an engraver. With this, in this, he shows Newton, who is impervious to the colorful world around himself, concentrating exclusively on the black lines on his white sheet. Structurally, Newton is repeating the sin of Satan in Milton's Paradise Lost. He is narcissistically contemplating his own model of nature represented in formulas of his own making. In his engraving The Ancient of Days, Blake personifies the authoritative claims of scientific rationality in the figure of Eurizen, a pun on your reason, who tries to control the entire cosmos with his mathematical exactitude. Here we see Eurizen, this is the title page of the whole book of Eurizen, squatted on the book of laws, blind for the tree of nature, which encircles the cave whose form repeats the law tablets Eurizen fills with his own writing. Now, um, Blake was of the opinion that Milton's attempts to reconcile Christian doctrine with scientific reason had failed aesthetically, not logically, aesthetically, because the figure of Satan was imbued with so much more grandeur, eloquence, and energy, and all my students agree, that he was much more convincing as the true principle of creation than God. The engraving of this uh, poem, Milton, which Blake wrote, shows Milton thus representative of imaginative poetry, dethroning Eurizen. Different from Milton, however, the Romantics did not see the human intellect as a continuation of divine uh, intellect, but as an agent. If you think about something, you change things. And this is shown in these metaphors of a very um, a key work in romantic studies, the mirror and the lamp. The mirror is the picture which was dominant in the West till the 18th century. The mind is just a mirror. It's passive. It's just taking what's coming in data from the outside. And the lamp is the mind which um, changes the things in its circumference, which gives it a certain perspective, one could say. You see it in the light of a specific um, color or something. But Blake, as most romantics, was very pessimistic because most people are living in the mind-forged manacles. That's uh, sort of how he put it. I will now skip Wordsworth and come to um, a very uh, short presentation of, um, these two, of two Victorian um, contributions to the study, I would say, to the study of consciousness. The Romantics, although they were going against monologic reasoning, as they saw it uh, in the new sciences, in the natural sciences, um, were nevertheless, without wanting this, um, furthering this subjectivized version of epistemology by stressing very much the individual experience as the starting point of any knowledge. This became a real problem in the 19th century because the findings of Charles Lyell in geology 
or of Charles Darwin in biology or other findings in physiology all showed that the individual did not count. And this, of course, didn't fit, didn't fit at all with this central position which had been given to subjectivity and individuality through the last 400 years um, in the um, Occidental discourse. So um, we just have here um, Alfred um, Lord Tennyson, this, and Thomas Hardy, who voice in their poems the absolute despair most intellectuals in the 19th century felt because they did not find this need for being accounted for in these new systems. Um, and for example, Alfred Lord Tennyson, this is a few lines from a very, very long poem. Are God and nature then at strife that nature lends such evil dreams, that's Doran. So careful of the type, she seems, so careless of the single life. And Hardy, in his final novel, um, Jude the Obscure, very pessimistic, um, sort of draws the bleak conclusion that if the individual cannot uh, sort of um, adjust to these new paradigms of explaining the world, um, then um, it just cannot survive. I'm coming to my third period, which is modernism. I still have 10 minutes, right? <laughs> modernism. For modernism, the crisis in representation becomes a crisis of representation. Representation no longer works no longer appears to offer the subject any cognitive access to the object. Because mass culture, political, economic, and social concerns were all seen as manifestations of a general pseudo-communication, which means communal delusions based on false premises. So people are talking with each other and it all appears to be very logical and they understand each other that they are all built on false premises. The central problems for modernists were, one, the fact that the human mind, according to Kant, can only perceive the world through the glasses of a priori conditions of space and for the modernists, much more problematic of time. Two, the monological self-centeredness. Leave this away and three, verbal representation. As far as the problem of time is concerned, they were very much influenced by uh, Henri Bergson, who distinguishes between the objective time as it is measured by sciences and the subjective time as it is experienced by the individual. And um, T.S. Eliot, in his four quartets, um, there's this one big poem, Bernd Norton, um, addresses this differentiation. To explore the room or tomb or dreams, all these are usual pastimes and drugs and features of the press. Man's curiosity searches past and future and clings to that dimension. But to apprehend the point of intersection of the timeless with time is an occupation for the saint. Here are two kinds of consciousness, and the only true consciousness for the modernists, like T.S. Eliot, is the consciousness which is not working according to the rules of time. So, of course, this would be, in our diction, much closer in psychoanalytical language to the subconscious, not to consciousness. Wait a second. Time past and time future allow but a little consciousness. To be conscious is not to be in time. The second problem, the self-centeredness. In his attempt to depict an epiphanic moment, one of these moments outside of time, as they would call it, he describes the perception in the following way. And the bird called in response to the unheard music hidden in the shrubbery 
and the unseen eye beam craft for the roses have the look of flowers that are looked at. The whole semantic field of perception, consciousness, intellect is here portrayed as a dialogue called in response to the music, the unseen eye beam crossed. Of course, this is also as a Perkipi asked uh, Bishop Barclay, to be is to be observed. And we heard sort of the present day versions of this several times here. Um, but it is exactly this kind of consciousness which supplies meaning and understanding, not explanation in the scientific way. Surrounded by a grace of sense are the objects in this perception. Both a new world and the old made explicit, understood. But these moments, of course, cannot be produced, but they just have to be awaited. There is only the unattended moment when it happens unawares. Okay, I'll skip D.H. Lawrence and E.M. Foster and come to representation. How can you represent such a moment? Basically, you can't. I can only say there we have been, but I cannot say where. And I cannot say how long, for that is to place it in time. These are only hints and guesses. Of course, good poets that they are, they still try to represent it, um, but I'm not going to go into that. But for the modernists, it is the human trait to move, to oscillate between these different kinds of consciousness. The hint half guests, the gift half understood is incarnation. And now I'm coming to my final thing. Postmodernism sees those questions of representation which in modernism have been dealt with from an epistemological perspective. How do I get through the signs to a reality that's epistemology. For postmoderns, it's an ontological question. They deny that there is any experience outside of representation. They say, first there is representation. All we have is knowledges put into discourses of knowledge. This, then, is our knowledge. And this knowledge shapes what we then call experience. Now, of course, this is a very bleak picture, you know, and um, the human mind would be just sort of coded by cultural contexts. And there have been many attempts, or there's sort of a trend, I would even say, in postmodern literature also, to retrieve reality and the agency of the individual. And this is my very, very final um, text I'm going to talk about, and that is Jan Martel, Life of Pi. The Indian title hero, Pi, the name of this hero, is his program. Being named after the love of a family friend for French swimming pools, Piscine, which is bungled into the derogative Pissing Patel by schoolmates, he makes it a habit to jump towards the blackboard whenever his name is asked and to write down, my name is Piscine Molitor Patel, known to all as Pi Patel. Pi equals 3.14. Thus, he marks himself as a specialist for infinity, and he transgresses or transcends fundamental horizons circumscribed by cultural norms and religions. Pi is a practicing Hindu, a practicing Muslim, and a practicing Catholic simultaneously, to the chagrin of his westernized father, owner of a zoo. When the family wants to emigrate to Canada, the ship sinks, and Pai finds himself on a rescue boat alone with a tiger from the zoo, with a hyena, and an orangutan. The book, the whole book, is now the narration of what happens during this shipwreck. And at the end, of the very, of the whole novel, a Japanese official comes up who says, this is nonsense. Nobody can survive like eight months on the Pacific with a Bengal tiger in one boat. 
And he says, now give me a plausible story. Give me one for the insurance company, which I need, without wonders and tigers and so on. And we get another story, seven pages full of deaths, gory incidences, and human suffering. The official chooses the first version for his report, the novel, which forms the end of the novel, uncommented. Un un uh, un and my interpretation will be contained in the concluding remarks of my talk now following. The reading of English literature has shown that there are many different models consciousness when we just look at the interrelation of experience, knowledge, and representation. But that's not to be lamented. What we see is consciousness at work. I myself find it hard to decide whether the traditional, ontological, or the postmodern representational model of human consciousness is true. As Life of Pi illustrates, one phenomenon will trigger very different stories, stories of ingenuity and stories of brutality. What is of paramount importance is the awareness that these narratives are possible versions, and that nevertheless, the choice of a narrative is supremely significant because they imply how we conduct our lives. Pi would have gone mad in the face of the unbearable hardships without the visions of nature, humanity, brutality, and beauty, which all three religions opened up to him. And by living these stories, of course, they are not artificial anymore. They are our lives, right? Fictionality is redeemed into reality. The very final lines, the story the horizon of the story I have presented here is framed by conditions of religions, epistemologies, and knowledges of the Occident, imbued with cultural authority by being fixed in and dispersed by institutions and discourses. The TSC project is negotiating consciousness in a dialogue of the sciences and the arts on a global scale. Now, as long as we talk to each other, or as you talk to each other, in the language of mathematics and science, you can be sure that you know what you're talking about. But as soon as we enter into natural languages, for example, trying to talk about the self in holy scriptures of the Orient, or talking about the self in the Occidental horizon, big problems arise. What I have seen here done, and it was very inspiring, is that many are trying to draw analogies between what's going on in a quantum uh, physics, quantum sciences, and, be, and, holy, and, and sort of structures in holy scriptures of the Occident. Of course, this can be done, and it can be inspiring, but this is, this is mythological thinking, as Ernst Cassira describes it. It's perfectly okay, but we have to keep in mind hermeneutics, the way of how to deal with ascribing meaning to natural languages of different times, of different cultural horizons, that's the field of transcultural hermeneutics. And this field has been developed and changed just as much as all those changes in the natural science we have seen here. To finish my talk, with this horizon and this in mind, this is a quote by E.M. Foster, written in a letter while he wrote his world literature novel, Passage to India. Expansion, that is the idea we must cling to. Not completion, not rounding off, but opening out. Thank you. Um, uh, the point I want to make is that uh, when one explores literature, and tries to see uh, whether the thinking of the author and the dominant thought processes of that age were different from us, one finds that the picture is very complex. First of all, in each age, there were different kinds of authors who were expressing different ways of relating their own human experience. For example, when you go to Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, 
you find that he's very modern. So my point is that perhaps the scholar of literature is imposing a certain construct by picking and choosing texts and then weaving a story. And reality is not simple and linear. And therefore, uh, the lessons that one draws from such comparisons and such constructions can be very subjective. And another scholar might pick some other text and come up with a radically different story. You're perfectly right. I mean, the, what you described is what I said with this very short term of the interdiscourse. Um, but knowing this, it is of paramount importance to mark in the beginning, of course, what I have presented here is sort of a selection of literary texts which fits with the topic of this conference, mainly consciousness studies. How has this topic been dealt with sort of in four decisive epochs of British literature? Um, and I have taken texts, not of marginal authors, and I don't, haven't presented them in very idiosyncratic readings. I didn't even have the time for that. But I've really presented them, say, um, from the perspective of a history of mentalities, sort of being what were culturally dominant discourses on these uh, 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 sub on these subjects, on these questions. So it's not, I mean, of course, there have always been counter discourses. I mean, that's what, how culture works. Um, also, the fact that I have presented it as a linear narrative, um, of course, that's narrativity, that's narratology, but everything I heard about the cosmos is a narrative of time as well, right? And trying to, to break this up is very difficult because, the, I mean, I'm talking now about the oxen because I know too little um, about um, and the oriental epistemologies um, because there to talk about time is to talk in terms of chrono chronology. But of course, also in, in philosophy, there are many attempts breaking this up and say time is something different from chronology. Um, but of course, for, I mean, it's sort of um, more simple. Um, yes, it is a subjective construct. But of course, what we are doing here, all of us, is exactly that. Right? We are constructing a specific perspective onto specific phenomena, a specific um, assembly of phenomena, which I mean, you devise by selecting the material, devising the experiments, and so on. And of course, we, are, you know, we also have material, but this is material that doesn't work according to laws or something like that, but it works completely different because it's creating meaning. But this does not mean, and that's what my talk was going about with the hermeneutic part, this does not mean that it's just, oh, anybody can just read anything in it. Because there is a methodology in hermeneutics, and that's what I wanted to make clear. Right?